from 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Critical condition. That's how Senate President Dominic Ruggiero describes the state of Rhode Island's health care system with hospitals under financial strain and patients struggling to get primary care. Will the Senate's new package of health legislation make a difference? And should lawmakers do more to hold RIDOT accountable for the Washington Bridge crisis? This week on Newsmakers, Senate President Dominic Ruggiero and Senate Majority Leader Ryan Pearson. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Our guests this week, Senate President Dominic Ruggiero and Senate Majority Leader Ryan Pearson. Gentlemen, good to have you back in the program. Uh, good morning. Good, good to be here. Thanks for having us. So we do want to get to that important conversation uh, about health care, as I said in the, in the open. But first, still top of mind, three months running the Washington Bridge. The main question right now, Senate President, is its future. Uh, Target 12 obtained an engineering inspection report that recommended a, at least a massive overhaul, if not complete replacement of that bridge. Transportation officials say they will likely make an announcement uh, later this month about its future. But are you, are you getting any sense as to what to expect? And, I, and I'm really asking about the price tag, what it, ballpark, what it could potentially cost. Are they giving you any indications? Now, obviously, we don't know right now. Uh, there's been studies that are being done by uh, different uh, groups on, on that wa Washington Bridge. And I think we have to keep in mind, these bridges don't last forever. Uh, there has to be, uh, you can't defer maintenance on these bridges because we have some of the worst in, in, in the country. In the country, uh, and we've, I think we've done a great job repairing these bridges. Looking at that particular bridge, I mean, that is a bridge that was never intended to carry that many vehicles over there over a period of time without a major overhaul. But, but, are, but are you asking? Uh, you know, are you asking what, uh, hey, you know, uh, Governor, hey, Director LVD, we're trying to plan budgets, uh, it, the 80-20 mix to, to repair these bridges, 80% federal, 20% state. Could be expensive. Are you pushing them on this, even behind the scenes? Well, we're waiting to see what the, what, what they're going to come out as far as uh, a manner in which to fix the bridges. How they're going to replace the whole bridge? Uh, are they going to replace uh, certain sections of the bridge? I mean, we'll be finding that information out in the very near future, and then we can make a concerted decision as to what how we're going to uh, look at this bridge and how we're going to address the situation to repair the bridge. And uh, the disruption has been absolutely phenomenal uh, with uh, people not only from this state, but people traveling into Massachusetts uh, that are using that particular uh, roadway for, for uh, uh, their, their, their needs. Uh, so we're waiting to see what the DOT comes back with, what the final decision is, and then we'll make a decision on that. And uh, there might be a lot of things that might be accompanying that. Uh, we don't know if that bridge was constructed in the manner that it should have been constructed at the time that it was constructed. So uh, we're going to do a, a deliberative and, and deep dive into into that particular situation and see what we come up with. But we can't do anything until we get the reports from uh, DOT and the uh, and those particular agencies that are working on providing those reports. Okay, uh, Leader, to you on this, you are, you're a money guy. You were the uh, finance chairman. When I talk about that 80-20 mix, are you yeah. worried about what this could cost the state and the taxpayers? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think federal match on projects is really important, and obviously this is going to be likely an expensive one, that the higher federal match we can get, uh, the better. Um, I know the governor has had conversations directly with the president on this issue and with Secretary Buttigieg, and so between them and our congressional delegation, we're going to be pushing our federal delegation to help as much as we can. I think we're both worried about it, um, but as the president said, we just don't know the exact, you know, exact fix yet uh, and the cost. So it's hard to you know, kind of approximate that yet. I, I don't want to spend too much more time on this. We'll move on to health care, as I said. But I, I, I got to ask you, Senate President, there have been calls for Director Alvidi to step down. Do you still have full confidence in him? Yes, I do. You do? I've, I've known uh, Director Alvidi for a number of years. I've had worked with him in the private sector. Uh, he was a uh, he was the public uh, 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 works director in Cranston. I think he has tremendous uh, knowledge, institutional knowledge, um, and uh, I, I just think that the job he's done since he's been in there has been absolutely phenomenal. He is the best DOT director that I have seen since I've walked in well, that well, building. Let's just address this head on real quick. I mean, you're a laborers guy. LVD ha has strong ties there. Should people feel confident that you can be objective about this? I am objective. Look, I'm, I'm going to tell everyone that Peter LVD is a friend of mine. However, 
whatever. Uh, it's about doing the job, and I think he's done a great job. I have full confidence in him. And he, look, he didn't inspect the bridge. He didn't know this was happening. We have bridge inspectors out there inspecting bridges uh, every day uh, during the week. Uh, you, uh, as I said before, our bridges are in such terrible shape, and I think one of the, the, uh, the channels did uh, uh, a little expose on some of the bridges that are still uh, in very bad shape. We've I mean, done a few stories on those, uh, yes. Well, we had, <laughs> we, we, I mean, Route 10 was being held up by two by sixes. I mean, uh, I don't think anyone wanted to drive under that. That's how dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, as I said before, you, you can't uh, you can't defer maintenance. Uh, and we only have to look at our schools and, and the situation that's happened with our schools as far as the repairs that we have to do. Imagine the wear and tear it takes on roadways with uh, heavy trucks and, and, and vehicles like that. So uh, we have a lot of work to do on our bridges. I think we've done a lot of work so far. And uh, I think we have to keep going. And this is just one of the things that, uh, that, that happens uh, when you defer maintenance over a period of time. All right, let's turn to that big package of health care bills mm -hmm. the Senate put out this week. I'm going to start with you on this one, Leader Pearson. There's we are not going to go through all 25 bills. <laughs> we don't have, yeah, we don't have time for that. Um, and it covers a whole bunch of different things, medical debt, uh, price transparency, primary care physicians, all these different topics. But yet again, there's talk about increasing rates. Um, this time, primary care physicians, they need to be paid more. And we're hearing this constantly. The hospitals don't have enough money. A.G. Narona is talking about it. As Tim said, you were finance chairman, Leader Pearson. Uh, you know, the, we're talking of, in other contexts about how the budget's getting tighter as the federal money runs out. Healthcare is already the most expensive thing in the budget. Where would all this extra money come from that everyone says needs to start to get plowed into the healthcare system to, to shore it up? Yeah, I think you have to go back over the last decade and see how much we underinvested in Medicaid where we start. And it may sound like, okay, more in Medicaid, you know, more for that specific healthcare, but it's also a hidden tax on insurance premiums for those businesses and individuals that are buying because the system gets subsidized by the commercial payers when the state doesn't do our job on Medicaid. And so the state needs to do its job on Medicaid. Do you think there's pressure on the commercial rates to get higher because the state didn't That's put right. enough in on the Medicaid right. side? The hospitals have to provide the services. And so if Medicaid's undercutting, they have to make it up elsewhere, which is where you see a transition to the commercial market. Um, so that's a big problem. The other thing that we have to recognize here in Rhode Island is that our population is older. It has more utilization than some of our neighboring states. Uh, and we also require more things to be covered. And so the combination of those things while we try to keep premiums down is also very difficult. And so this is not a simple issue. Um, it's one that we have to make this investment in. It's one of those things that, you know, the governor laid out a plan over several years to get there. We're going to try to accelerate that as much as we can around increasing Medicaid rates. But this is not something you fix in a, in a, one, in a one shot, but it is something we have to say, this is what we need to get to, and we're going to have to figure out the plan to get there. It's going to require tight budgets, it's going to require cuts, uh, or maybe not spending in other areas. That is for sure. Um, but it's not something we have an option. Rhode Islanders need to have care. Uh, and they, they expect to be able to have a doctor when they need one. You, Senate President, floated an interesting idea in the end of year interview rounds about uh, should Rhode Island think about a public medical school at maybe at URI or something like that. It seems like there wasn't a lot of appetite among your fellow leaders at the State House about that. But um, you're, you're trying some other things because you think you need to make it easier for primary care physicians to come in, as I understand it. Uh, that's correct, uh, uh, Ted. Uh, obviously, we're looking to attract the primary care physicians because those are the ones that are, le are leaving. Those are the ones that are more difficult for people to get appointments with. So we're looking to attract them. I mean, the idea to float something that uh, maybe URI would like to do a medical school and focus on those particular areas, uh, I think it's something that we, we would have to look into. Uh, look, we have Brown University that uh, has really been helpful in to, to our medical field, uh, but I think we need something a little more than that. Uh, so we can re retain people here. And whether that's through uh, uh, reductions in tuition or they have to, to stay in the state for a, an extended period of time, uh, we, we want to see. Because I would like to have hearings on that bill and just see what, what people uh, might, be th might be thinking once, once we submit the legislation. But I think it's something that we should, uh, we should take a serious look at. And I think that'll, uh, that'll stem the, uh, uh, the exodus of doctors going to, to Massachusetts and Connecticut uh, because the uh, compensation is higher. We might pivot back to health care in a moment. We've got a couple of minutes before we have to go to a break. But there's, uh, real quick, there's a push to change the state's Access to Public Records Act, which is the state's transparency law. It gives public's right to access uh, government and the work that it does. It died last year. Uh, when you talk to your Senate colleagues about the bill this year being considered, is that one you see having momentum or not? 
Uh, actually, we haven't really started looking at bills in, 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 in that manner yet. We just submitted the legislation so everyone can How about get you? Are you interested in it? Uh, I am interested in uh, taking a look at it and seeing what, uh, what, what, what comes up with that, uh, with that particular proposal. All right, um, and we, as I said, we have to go to a break, but real brief here, the, uh, the Senate just lost a veteran member, uh, Senator Frank Lombardo, after a battle with cancer. What do you want people to know about him? Well, first of all, he was an outstanding senator. He represented his constituents in, 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 in a manner which they richly deserved. Uh, he was not the type of person that would walk around and look for credit for things. He worked to uh, uh, give an assignment, and he, and he accomplished it. Uh, he was very into veterans affairs and things of that nature, which a lot of people didn't know about him. Uh, Frank was just an absolutely, uh, uh, he was a friend of mine, and actually he's a family member because he, uh, his daughter married my nephew. Oh, I didn't know uh, that. So I got to That's know very him. That's very Rhode Island. I was just uh, going to say that. It's a Rhode Island thing. <laughs> uh, and I got to know him a lot better. Uh, but he was an absolutely phenomenal. That was a huge loss to the Senate. And, you know, a little before that, we lost Senator Mary yeah, Ellen Goodwin. Of course. Yep. Uh, so it's, it's been a really tough year for the, uh, uh, you know, it's been a tough term for the Senate. And But uh, Frank was an absolutely tremendous person. He was the, the uh, chair of housing, and uh, he did an absolutely great job. And, uh, I mean, he, he fought like hell. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, a tremendous loss to the Senate. All right, we're going to take a break on the program. Our conversation with the Senate President and Senate Majority Leader continues when we come back on Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside Ted Nisi. Our guests this week are Senate President Dominic Ruggiero and Senate Majority Leader Ryan Pearson. Ted? Uh, Leader Pearson, yes, just yesterday, Speaker Shikarchi put out a new package of housing bills. We, you both know that's his big issue over in the House. Um, the big sticking point that's carried over from last year is this ADU bill, Accessory Dwelling Units In-Law Apartments. I know in the Senate last year, some rank-and-file senators had concerns about the way that was written. You've suggested in other interviews there might be now room for compromise this year. What's the latest in that bill? Do you see it going through this year on the Senate side? Listen, I think the Senate President and I share a view that uh, we'd like to work with the Speaker on this issue. Our members had significant concerns on the way it was drafted. You know, in short, it changes some of the requirements around approvals and makes it more of a by right you can build. Um, and I think, you know, some of the, when you get into the specifics of it, um, you know, under the bill that was passed by the House and we have would allow uh, up to a two bedroom, 1200 square foot ADU. Um, that's a very significant structure uh, on a property that I think uh, our members have concerns about and particularly concerns uh, if the main residence is an owner occupied. And so those are some of the kinds of things uh, that are in there. I think Senator Gu has put in uh, legislation that I think has a bit more protections. Um, and I think, still think Herbal likely needs some additional work as well. But I think it's an area we can find compromise on. I think we agree on the intent uh, and we agree on being able to have more housing units, particularly for those that it would serve. Um, so I think we can get there, but I, we got to work on the, the details. Uh, when we have, I'm going to stick with you, Leader, when we have um, lawmakers on the show, I always like to go to the uh, Senate or House page and look at the legislation you, you propose, particularly if you're a prime sponsor. And Leader, you're a prime sponsor to bill that would allow a school district district to meet the required 180 days using, quote, longer school days or a combination of longer school days and shorter days in which school is in session. What, yeah. What's this about? This came from my uh, my hometown, uh, so the superintendent. Cumberland. It's a Cumberland uh, issue, but I think it's also uh, in other issues the communities as well, they're having the same thing. The Superintendents Association had brought it up to me. Um, effectively, districts are trying to think about how can they schedule their time uh, in a way to make sure that they have the time to do the curriculum training and development, uh, making sure that teachers are getting sort of the best practices. And they need flexibility in how they schedule their days. So maybe doing an early release day uh, on a Wednesday, as an example, um, and being able to make that count for the whole year, um, it's a mathematical adjustment that allows them the flexibility to be able to make sure they so get it's that for training. P for PD days, yes. essentially, yes. is what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, I want to ask about pensions, which we talked a lot about a decade ago when the reform bill was going through. You just had the uh, Treasury DOS's uh, reform or advisory group put out a report, but didn't actually give you all any recommendations on what to do, just said, here's how much every different possibility would cost. Um, Senator President, you were there when the big pension reform past that Gina Raimondo spearheaded as treasurer. We get emails almost daily now from retirees saying it's been too long, it needs to be adjusted without inflation adjustments, it's, it's killing us in our cost of living. Um, do you think 
the leg- the assembly needs to do something to up those pension benefits for those retirees 12 years after it passed. I think we have to take a close look at the Treasurer's pension report. He does outline a number of options that we should uh, look at. Uh, we could possibly, possibly, and I don't know if we can do this because we'd have to run the numbers. And, you know, uh, uh, we normally do this type of uh, work in committee, uh, but we'd have to see maybe a combination of a couple of the suggestions that he's making that we could we could work with. I would love to see them get some kind of compensation because those people deserve it, the retirees the actives and the problem is that there are two groups there are the retirees and the actives and they're kind of fighting each other uh, but we're going to take a look at it uh, coming up probably in the next two weeks we're going to be having hearings on that uh, on, on the proposal uh, it might be in the legislative form so uh, we'll make that determination and as I said I'd love to give them some kind of compensation or some something back uh, because they are aging out a lot of those people especially the retirees uh, but we'll have to take a look at it and I certainly don't want to make any commitment at this time, uh, and that that would be ultimately premature. Uh, Stick with you, (laughs) Senator President. You're a prime sponsor of a bill that would overhaul the law that governs how police officers are disciplined or fired. It's called the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights, or LEABOR. A lot of our viewers know that acronym. Uh, A key difference in the House bill by Rep. Ray Hull is the makeup of the hearing panel. Um, Your version would include the head of the Nonviolence Institute on it. The House version does not. Would you be willing to drop that aspect of your bill so they're both so they're more in line? Uh, we're in discussions on that right now, and there's uh, one or two other things in that bill that we're discussing uh, as far as the level, uh, certain levels in there. Uh, I think we're. What's the c- biggest source of tension between the two chambers and the two versions? Well, there's really not a lot of tension. We're, we're just trying to figure out uh, what is the best solution here. What, what is the appointment by the chief judge of the Supreme Court of appointing someone uh, as part of the, the composition of, of, of the commission? We're, we're discussing that issue right now because we want to make sure it's the right person that gets appointed there. Uh, so we don't want to be subject to any kind of criticism. We don't want to come back and address this situation again. We want to do it once. We want to do it right. Uh, but that's uh, that's what right now, that's, that's what's sticking out there. And we're working on that. And, and I'm confident we can get there. I'm confident we're going to end up with this session with legislation on Leopold. You think this is the year? Yes, All absolutely. Right. Um, let's talk about politics a little. And, Senate President, you have a line that I like to quote sometimes, which is that the last operating mill in Rhode Island is the rumor mill. Uh, and uh, that's been up and running recently because you missed some se- legislative sessions recently. And uh, it's, it's led to speculation about how, you, how is your health, how are you feeling. So I'm just going to ask you directly, how is your health, how are you feeling, and are you, are you going to run again? Uh, I will. Uh, I am planning to run again uh, for the seat of Fourth Senatorial District. Uh, my health. I've had some uh, uh, medical issues that I've been dealing with. I'm doing much better now, day by day. I'm, I'm doing much better. I think I'm going to be in uh, pretty good shape in the next month, uh, and I am going to run again uh, for for the seat. And uh, Leader Pearson, everyone wonders who's going to be next up at some, you know, many many years from now when the Senate President decides to retire. Do you want the job? Absolutely. Um, I've, I've said it before. I think as soon as the Senate President's uh, ready to retire, I'm ready to step up uh, if my colleagues will support me to do so. Um, I think there's a lot of work left to do. I have a lot of passion uh, to do it in the Senate. Uh, and we've got a great team. We've got a great team of chairs, a great team of senators. Um, you know, I'd be really foolish to not want to take an opportunity to lead the chamber. Leader, uh, you've made education the cornerstone of your time at the General Assembly often, and you have uh, yet another bill. Uh, that would require all teachers hired after July 1st to participate in Social Security. Right now, public school teachers yeah. don't pay into Social Security, so they don't get it. Um, why do you support this, and yeah. who asked you to so, file it? So some districts do, and some districts don't. That's, um, and that's, that's one of the things that, as the President was mentioning earlier about retirees and pensions, I think if you're a 20-something-year-old coming out of college today, one of the first things you're not thinking of is, if I accept a job offer in District A or District B, Uh, which one am I going to get Social Security in? You're not thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm betting teachers probably aren't thinking about that until they get to their 50s, and at that point it's too late. And so, you know, I think it's it's an additional layer of retirement security, uh, and we should be making sure that all Rhode Islanders 
uh, and especially our teachers, have the opportunity to gain Social Security. Um, it was a decision made many years ago um, that I think has put a lot of retirees in a bad spot where they're not eligible. Um, and we need to fix it, and it needs to be an opportunity. Um, it's going to be something we have to work with the feds on, but I think it's something that's well worth us looking into. Uh, I have to ask you about the Pawtucket Soccer Stadium um, and the cost of that project. I'm going to ask uh, for, to you, Senate President, on this. You know, the, the state had committed to $27 million of the construction of the stadium. The cost of the debt is going to be $132 million under the structure of the deal that's gone through. Why didn't the Assembly just bite the bullet and appropriate the $27 million to avoid that tens of millions of dollars more in interest costs? I got a better question. Uh, why do we keep the Pawtucket Red Sox <laughs> here and uh, build a stadium for them? Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't really know. I wasn't really involved in, uh, you know, in the negotiations or any of the discussions uh, that took place. Uh, that was the administration. Uh, I just got things uh, secondhand. Uh, that is going to be an expensive proposition ultimately. Uh, but I think that uh, what I'm encouraged about is the ancillary development that is going to go on around the stadium. I think it's going to uh, be a, a vital uh, a renewal for uh, Pawtucket. I think it's going to be something that's going to help uh, in that area. And you know, you don't know what's going to happen because soccer is becoming a very popular sport, especially in the New England area. So uh, I'm hoping it's successful, uh, and, and, and we'll see what happens. Your initial response is interesting to me because I remember a time where you were trying to be the diplomat between Raimondo and Mattiello as they fought about the Paw Sox. It didn't work, and they left town. That and sounds like a regret We only me. have 15 seconds left. Sorry. Okay. Uh, look, uh, uh, we, built a, we built a bridge for $22 million. I thought we could have given $23 million to a stadium that attracted people in the, the, uh, for entertainment purposes. All right. Senate President Dominic Ruggiero and Majority Leader Ryan Pearson, thanks for joining us. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. An update now on our show last week. On Thursday, House Speaker Joe Shikarchi announced yet another package of bills aimed at tackling the state's housing crisis. People ask me, why do you keep introducing housing legislation? The House has already passed over the last three years more than 30 bills. Well, my answer is look around. Have we solved the problem? No, not even close. Shikarchi announced 15 bills that propose new ideas and several changes to existing law, including expanding access to accessory dwelling units or in-law apartments. If passed, it would allow homeowners to rent ADUs out to non-family members as long as they're not being used for short-term rentals. Another would allow cities and towns to count mobile homes as affordable housing units. Some bills, including those that affect local control over planning and zoning, will likely get resistance from cities and towns. We'll continue to track those proposals throughout this year's legislative sessions. That's all the time we have for Newsmakers. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. You can scan that QR code right there in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.